Hi. Hi. I'm Jill. And I'm Ray. Let's go cruising. All right. We already went cruising, actually. So we're at the park as we speak <laughs> because it is Cinco de Mayo. Cinco de Mayo today. Well, today. Yeah, today for us. You for know. us. <laughs> <laughs> so. But it's Cinco de Mayo. And here, it's a pretty big deal. In some areas, definitely. Yeah. Um, you know, it, we always have this uh, festival that in Denver. It's really fun. It, and it's uh, the Cinco de Mayo. Celebrate Culture Festival, and it was established in the 70s, 73, so people go and get crunk, they get, not crunk, crunk. <laughs> they don't get crunk, oh my God, I haven't heard that <laughs> they go, <in> years, <laughs> they go downtown crunk. and they all just mingle, there's food and elotes, all the turkey legs, elotes. there's beer, there's dancing music, it's just, it's so fun, I love it. Oh, it's such a vibe. It is. So... We wanted to talk about some Latino roots. Yes. More specifically, a little bit of my Mexican American heritage and then a little bit of Rachel's Chilean American roots. Indeed, because I mean, hey, even though it's Cinco de Mayo, might as well give you guys a little bit of brief stuff about Chile. Hey, here for Cin Cinco de Mayo today isn't just for the Mexicans. It's for like all Latinos who are proud of their culture. And yeah. I think that's. That's why Cinco de Mayo is so special here. It's all about pride. It's a big deal. It's a pretty big deal here. To like, there's always it's a two day weekend, and and it's just celebrating Latino culture. Yeah, so. I really like that. It's just about the pride, really, the pride of your culture. Yeah. So. So a little bit about Cinco de Mayo, actually. I had some did some research, and I wanted to share. So we're starting what, yours. Y y yes. Okay. <laughs> um, so I wanted to kind of get into Cinco de Mayo as what what it what the holiday holiday actually means. Um, so it commemorates the the Franco Mexican War that happened May fifth, eighteen sixty two, and it was also called the Battle of Puebla. Um, and it's actually a minor holiday in in Mexico. I have heard that. Like Mexicans don't really. It's just, it is a holiday, but it's kind of like Veterans Day for us, you know? Yeah, yeah. Like, it's it's like... For yeah. the motherland. Yeah. Yeah. But here, it really blew up in American culture. Um, and, it, and it's usually... And it's not just Denver that, you know, celebrates it in a parade and all that. It's heavily populated Latino, Hispanic areas of all the states so oh heck yeah it's a pretty big deal in american culture and not even because of the war it's just about pride exactly so so that's how it kind of evolved over here and why it's such a bigger deal than it is for the mexicans <laughs> yeah and i've always honestly wondered that because i've heard from motherland mexicans in the like in my past like they say the same thing they're usually yeah. like uh it's we don't really care yeah they don't, <laughs> they don't go all out it's not like the other los muertos or you know like independence day it's not like that yeah but anyway so a little bit about our festival like i said it was established in the 70s more specifically 1973 and it was to promote develop economic economic community programs and projects that rise the income, educational, and political levels of Denver residents. Okay. So, again, they just wanted to share with everybody their Latino pride. And <laughs> a lot of things that you can do at the festival. This is so cute. We have Chihuahua races. Aww. And there's taco eating contests. <laughs> Low rider car shows. There's the parade, and there's live music with, like, all of the... But you had me at Chihuahua <laughs> races. Like, once you said they that, do. oh, my they, God. They all kind of dress up, too, and it's just a whole bunch of little chihuahuas, and they're ready. Really? It's so funny. There's so many chihuahuas walking oh around. Oh, my God. <laughs> it's so fun. Cute. And um, one of the special things that I like to see at the festival 
are the Flicorico dancers. Yes. Uh, and my sisters were Flicorico dancers for many years. Which uh, you, I'm so happy you took me to their performance. My first performance, or like watching that anyways, was on Cinco de Mayo. Yeah. Was, yeah, you that? took me downtown. Yeah. yeah. I was like, oh my God, this is so cool. Yeah, I love them. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, Flocorico dancers are the, uh, they're the Mexican dancers that have the brightly colored poofy dresses and they like hold them up like fans and they twirl them and they're, it looks like they're quote unquote tap dancing in a way. Mm -hmm. So that's what, that's what they are. But, uh, so I dig, a, dug a little deeper in Flocorico dancing and its history. So, um, according to, uh, Gabriela Mendoza Garcia, she was a dance scholar, choreographer, art director, and um, so this was the site that I learned from her. And she said, Flocorico can be traced back to uh, ceremonial and social dances with the amongst the indigenous people of Mexico. Okay. So that's how far it can go be be traced back. Wow. Um, and then the Spanish conquistadors arrived and they brought their, their own music and danced and during the colonial period, um, the the style of dances became started to merge into the other culture. So it was like blending in yeah. a lot of um, different styles and music. Mm -hmm. and a lot of other parts can be influenced by, um, depending on the area in Mexico, a lot of it was blended with Germany, France, and some parts of Asia and Africa. So it just depends on which state you go and they all have their own unique style of dances because it. of all of the like inner mixing and it would just blend together and it would just make this beautiful dance like it's really cool to Heck yeah. see how different each one is and they all have their own styles with mm -hmm. the dresses like they don't come out on stage with the same dress twice you yeah. know <laughs> so they have a bunch of costumes that match the state and so it was quote Every state has its own unique dance that represents them. And this was a quote by uh, Raquel uh, Ramirez. And she was a, a ballet teacher, director in, um, in Santa Monica. And sometimes the dance will, will depict an animal from the area or like a historical event or an element of local life. So that, that was kind of the performance that they wanted to show okay so and then so footwork zapateado which is toes heels soles and the ball of your foot so when they're dancing they use their whole foot and um every pressure point it sounds like and and they stomp to a rhythmic beat to the music so that it's kind of hard it's complicated it's really complicated i'm not a dancer yeah. my, my sisters were i didn't do that um, it's hard. I tried. It's it's really hard because they, that's, they, they become part of the music when they dance. As you should. And, like literally, their their, tapping is going to the beat of the whatever song that they're dancing to. So it depends on how fast it goes, how slow. I love it. It's it's really complicated. Oh my god. <laughs> and um, so this is interesting. Dancers don't wear tap shoes. They make the tap sound from tiny little nails that is put in the sole of the shoe. Oh. On the tips of the toe and then on the heel. I didn't know that. That's that's all that's um that's the tapping that you hear is from, from that. That's awesome. So over the years nowadays companies have incorporated newer elements like since the conquistador days or whatever uh -huh. they added more elements to the dances so now it's starting to blend with um ballet and modern dancing so they're kind of incorporating like the, i remember there was one performance my sister did and they danced barefoot which is whoa really different yeah um because they use their shoes that's yeah like, but they were dancing barefoot and it was like a ballet performance so it was really, but it was beautiful. They still had the dress on. They were just barefoot. But Probably it, showing off the footwork. But it was awesome. Yeah, it was really cool. And she, there was one point where she lifts up the, the little skirt so you see her feet, and she's kicking like as fast as she can going to the music. It was so cool. And 
yeah they wow. very talented very talented dancers flocorico dancers are so talented that is awesome and it's a really big deal here so if you ever want to throw your kid into dance yeah you should honestly Do some they would love it any skill set in music whether it be dance playing an instrument I agree. I like love, I love singing music, just get your kids in it's like another language the arts yes <laughs> Oh my god. Love it. Love it. So anyway, um, Amelia Hernandez is the first to be known for this, that she cre she blended ballet and modern dance into Flocorico. So that's when it, the blending started to happen. Okay. And this was during um, the 1950s in Mexico. And Amelia Hernandez, if I'm sure if you do do Flocorico, you would know what I'm talking about with this one. She, she made a dance in... Um, her most famous dance that she choreographed was uh, La Revolución. And Hernandez used the Flocorico to tell the story of women soldiers during the Mexican Revolution. Nice. And I remember my sisters, I'm pretty sure they performed that. They marched out and they had the little wood rifles and they're marching with their and their stuff oh, and, cool. and then they did like a, a little dance with it well, they had their props yeah so it was really cool so they were representing hell yeah some badass women in mexico obviously <laughs> so that one was pretty cool um and like another examples of popular dances um which i'm sure again if you dance to corico you'll know what i'm talking about um jarabe tapatio which is from jalisco and it's the Mexican hat dance. Um, and <laughs> the most internationally renowned national dance since 1924 in Jalisco. So this dance is a pretty big deal. And that's the one where they, pretty sure they like dance around the hat that's on the floor in the oh, partners. Oh, okay, yeah, I've seen one? that, yeah. And they're dressed, and they're usually dressed in like the black, that looks like mariachi suits. They're the embroidered, um, jackets <laughs> see it's like mexican dance isn't just flamenco and mariachi no you know? no it's just a lot of different yeah things. and the girls i'm pretty sure are wearing like white blouses with the black um like uh, apron and the red the red skirts okay um but anyway that one's one of the popular ones another one is the danza de los viejitos <laughs> Aww. which is the little the the dance of the old man yep. <laughs> And this was from the um, the state of Michoacan, and it was created to mock the Spanish upper class in the 20th century, actually. So awesome. That, <laughs> so that's where that dance came from. Awesome. And they wear the little masks, and they're like kicking their their legs up all high. They and they dance with machetes at one point. That is wonderful. It's it's pretty fun. That's a fun one. That one's it's making really fun. fun. <laughs> it's really fun. It's so funny. And they come in with the canes and they're all wobbling, falling over each other Heck and they're yeah. laughing. And it's so cute. I love that dance. Um, another popular one is uh, Vera Cruz. Oh, I love the Vera Cruz ones. Oh, that one's so beautiful. So in the state of Veracruz, La Bamba is the hem of Veracruz. So that's the, the dance, La Bamba. Mm -hmm. And then there's La Bruja and Colas. And they're the pretty laced white dresses with the black aprons and the flowers. Okay. Like, and there's one, I don't know the name of the dance, I'm so sorry, but they dance with the candle on their head. I think I remember seeing like, that one. They sway, it, and it's so like serene and just oh, i love that dance i can't remember what the name is called but that's one that's those are beautiful dances but okay. those ones are I feel like very I saw, popular i feel like i saw one of those or at least a couple of those oh i'm sure you have <laughs> um and then there is yucatan um harana yucatan <laughs> so this one they dance in couples and this one was is one of the older traditional dances and this dance was born between the 17th and 18th century during the Spanish era and this one's more of like it's known as a mesitu harana so it's just a very sensual dance and so I don't know so, sensual sensual escándalo escándalo <laughs> Which leads me to what we were just saying just now. Like, it's all so different. It's not just mariachi or it's not just the, you know, the Aztec dancers, which they were really cool too. But yeah. there's so much more 
to their dance. It depends and, on the region you're in. And I feel like Mexico is very prideful through their, their arts. Good. I, at least I would think so. I, at least we I are. Mean, Latinos <laughs> in general are very prideful. Love watching those dancers. They're so fun. You can see them at the festival. For Cinco de Mayo here. It's really fun. But it goes into my next thing with Mexican music. And... I love Mexican music, okay? Yeah. I, I listen to like all kinds. Reggaeton, I like the old banda music, like all the traditional, you know? Vicente Fernandez, uh, he was El Rey. <laughs> R.I.P. Oh, I was literally about to just say that. Oh, I miss him. He was, he kind of made a turning point in Mexico for, he was for music. He Mexican Elvis. It, yeah, he He's very interesting. Maybe I'll talk about him more. Maybe. I don't know. We'll see. But anyway, so I just wanted to break down different types of, um, of Mexican music, traditional music, I guess, because I don't think everybody knows where they actually came from, you know? Mm. So I'll start off with mariachi music. Everybody knows mariachi music, right? Mm -hmm. You know, the... The, it's all over Coco. Yeah, all over Coco. The the guys at the restaurant that come sing to you. If anybody remembers Casa Bonita, I know they're about to. <laughs> they're in the middle of trying to rebuild and open, but yeah, they had mariachi there back in the day. Everybody knows that genre, Heck right? Yeah. So, it originated from southern the southern part of the state of Jalisco in the 19th century, and this musical genre goes beyond music. It's the sum of the cultural revolution expressed through a group of musicians dressed in popular clothing jarral suits to be more specific mm -hmm. <laughs> which encompass encompasses the essence of mexico and its people so you could hear it when they're belting their music oh in mariachi heck music. yeah like it comes from the gut for them yes it does so it's it's a very like the soul a lot of their songs are very passionate and they're just strong like low-key opera <laughs> they, they, they sing about love betrayal death politics revolutionary heroes even animals machismo like escándalo they'll sing about anything i remember roland and i were on one of our first dates and we were just sitting in his car and a mexican station just started playing <laughs> and all of a sudden he turned it up and we hear Mrs. Borracho. <laughs> I just started cracking up. He's like, what did he say? I was oh my like, God. I was like, you make me drunk. <laughs> like, essentially. Yes, I love I it. I love that. I love though. It. You can hear the but passion in his voice. But they so passionately, and that's what it's all about to be a mariachi singer. You know, they, they dig deep. Heck yeah. Uh, love mariachi music. <laughs> I know it can be a little annoying in the restaurant sometimes, but I love it. I love when they come. I always have a song ready. And it's usually either Estos Celos from Vicente. Estos Celos se amenano. Me lo que se. So just a portable jukebox for Mexicans. <laughs> or what else? Uh, my dad loves Borber. Also from Vicente. Oh. Borber, Borber. Borber. Yeah, there you oh, go. I love that song. That's a good one too. Anyway. So next up is banda music, and this one, I'm sure you've heard plenty of these. Oh, yeah. Going out dancing with me and everything, mm. so you'll know what I'm talking about with these ones. This one's a type of Mexican folk music from the northwestern state of Sinaloa, so that's where it originated from over there, um, and they were more influenced by the German and French music. Okay. So this is where the polka sound comes from oh. in this type of music. Because a lot of people, and I've had a friend who called it clown music. She's not too far Jesus. off. So. It's rude. I, I, I still love it. But it's it, funny. But it's to funny. like the foreign ear, you know, it sounds polka -ish. It It does. I've heard a lot of people just call it Mexican polka. Yeah. Like. So that's where it came from. So it, technically it is polka because it came from German and French folk music which is polka which you guys should see the polka king with jack black yeah that was a good one yeah uh, but i digress jack black. peaches 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 <laughs> <laughs> okay well um anyway but yes they are very similar to polka and they have usually a two note beat and a heavy horn section with a fast tempo and then stayed up beat so that's that's where you go where you're going down to the mexican dances and they're all just partnered up dancing. Yep. Do -do 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 -do. 
<laughs> with the two beat sound. Which I tell I tell my boyfriend that he can totally dance with me, but he's like, I I can't dance. And I was like, no, it's literally two steps. You're going yeah. to the beat. It's a two beat tempo. It's really not that hard. You should anyway. be. Yeah. <laughs> it's so fun though when it you is. dance with a partner. It's just really fun. It's two steps, but it's so fun. Um. Anyway, the next one I want to talk about is Wapango. And this one originates also from the Northeastern. Um, and it's Son Huasteco, which is a style that dates back from the 19th century. So Wapango music combines two four time with three four time and six eight time creating cross rhythms from great complexity okay so and then singers will often sing in the falsetto register okay so those are those are the ones um i guess they use a little bit more like flute they're they're not as like in your face as like mariachi and it's a, it's a little different but it's it's, it's a little hard to explain, it's, and it's a lot more, there's a lot more complex instruments playing while you're listening to this one. Okay. This ones are pretty fun, though, too. It's a very uh, complex rhythm of music, and it's... It's almost it's, jazzy, in a sense. It, yeah, in a way, it is. Very jazzy. I like The that. Mexican jazz. Yeah. <laughs> and then another one is uh, Rancheras. This one's the most popular genre of music in Mexico, and this takes, um, and this name is from the ranch land, so cowboy music. Mm -hmm. This one became so popular because it was dramatized with emotion, and it was poetic lyrics, and it was always used in movies. Okay, yeah. So, like during the the prime time of film, you know, in the 1930s and stuff. Uh huh. Um, they used. Uh, serenading songs and it was the ranchera style when they sing in their movies i love it so that's what that style is and again vicente fernandez was really popular for this because he was a movie star and mm -hmm. he sing just like in coco yeah so vicente fernandez was really popular for this um and then like i said it, you they would sing with such dramatic emotion and it was always passionate love songs you know poems po poetry just sung in song mm -hmm. so that's what the rancheras is and then my last one i wanted to talk about because it's one of my personal favorites it's cumbia cumbia yeah. <laughs> and um i'm sure some people probably don't know but cumbia does not trace back in mexican culture hmm. It's actually Colombian African culture. What a mix! Mm -hmm. It came from Colombia, so that's where cumbia originated from. Is Colombia? Okay. Um, it is not a typical Mexican. It is now. I mean, cumbia has just like it. It, it originated in Colombia, but it spread in through the Latino culture. It expanded. All and the way. yeah, and it and a lot of people just had so much fun with using the cumbia rhythm. You know, the the type of music. Uh huh. Um. But yes, it was. It likely began during like the 19th century, and it you, uh, it originally was a courtship dance created by enslaved Africans that were in the Caribbean oh. and in Colombia. So that's where the the music kind of derived from. from I them. see. And it was. It's used. They use a lot of drums, flutes, mm -hmm. and and they later added the accordion into the mix of the um, cumbia. And cumbia came to Mexico in the 1940s so mm. that's when cumbia started reaching mexico's ear the artist luis carlos mayer <laughs> constant <laughs> oh my gosh that's a mouthful of a name i'm just gonna call him luis carlos popularized cumbia in mexico along with big band orchestra names like rafael de paz and tony uh camarango so Gumbia in Mexico was is a bl is blended with mariachi influence and african caribbean styles and it kind of sounds kind of like similar to merengue. Okay. Um, and then modern cumbia has spread across all over the Latino American cultures. So, um, including Ar Argentina, Cuba, and Puerto Rico. Um, and this was all, this one is the style that you would probably hear me listen to all the time is the hip hop styles and mm -hmm. like all of the electric. Sometimes country is added into it, which yes. is very interesting. <laughs> but yeah, I'm more into like the hip hop styles, you know, like, um, 
Selena's the queen of cumbia, so you gotta listen to her. Yeah. <laughs> and a lot of hers is like, is that Selena mixed with pop? Yes, she's kind of one of the originators of that. I guess I would, I would say. Love her. Oh, I love Selena, girl. <laughs> Dreaming Ooh. of you. Oh. Anyway, yeah. So that's that's Mexican music for you, broken down. So now you know. You can impress your Mexican friends and be like, "Oh, I know what that is." <laughs> Unless I told you something wrong, then I'm sorry. Don't come at me. <laughs> anyway, that is awesome, and it's so similar to what we do in Chile. Yeah. So I see the cousins of the uh, Mexicans. <laughs> In a sense, <laughs> in a small sense, <laughs> so I'm gonna give you guys a little brief history about Chile here. So, I'm excited <laughs> as you should be. It's that little Cheeto country that's against Argentina. <laughs> Cheeto it country, it looks like a Cheeto. <laughs> it's just hugging Argentina, and it's like it's pretty down south there. So, uh, let's see, I had other like facts but i guess i didn't write it down but i mean it's known for having exquisite wine and beer so like the vineyards out there especially which i've been to one of them <laughs> beautiful at least one um easter island or la isla de pascua uh the world's largest swimming pool is also in chile large what large world's largest swimming pool oh. <laughs> world's largest swimming pool <laughs> yep. i just wanted to keep saying large yeah. Okay. I'll do a little more facts there later. But it's also known for having the tallest building in South America. And it has the driest place on Earth, which is the Atacama Desert. Ooh. And yeah, when I went to, I remember, I can't remember if it was the last time I went to Chile or the time before that. But we went to Castillero, or Castillero del Diablo. And it's out in the Atacama Desert. And my mom, I remember on the way there, it was so hot. I do remember that. It was so hot. But it was Melting. so much. Yeah. It was so much fun, though. And I remember my mom because she was telling me, you know, the facts and stuff. And I'm maybe like nine if it's at the time I'm guessing. So I was asking her, like, well, if it's so dry, then how are there how's their plant life like in a sense and she was like since chile is so thin it's literally the breeze from the ocean coming over into the desert that's that's helping hydrate a little bit interesting so that's how plants like dry obviously desert plants are that's able really to grow cool. out there yeah wow i just had Beautiful. like a not geo moment in my head when you just said <laughs> that <No. laughs> Which I think there is a Nat Geo episode about Chile on Disney Plus, so look into it. Yeah. But the country itself is gorgeous. I miss it a lot. And you can see the Andes Mountains from some of the beaches that mm -hmm. are out there. Like it's beautiful. And I went to many beaches out there. I'm sure you did, beach. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> North and South Beach. <laughs> So there's a lot of like main holidays and festivals that we do love to celebrate. And obviously, like any other culture, we celebrate Christmas and New Year's. But on Christmas Eve, which I'm sure is also similar to Mexico, that's when usually we do gifts. That's what we do. Yep. <laughs> we also have a tasty a fruit cake, our version of it, and it's called Pan de Pascua. And then there's Cola de Mono, which I think I had you try. Yes. Yes. Uh, so... It's called, it's monkey tail in translation, but it's essentially just milk, sugar, coffee, cinnamon, and then alcohol. That's our secret. <laughs> <laughs> so Christmas Day, because it's celebrated in the summer, most people have the tradition of going hiking or rock climbing, going to the beach, like having picnics outside. Uh, like you outside. would any other summer day. Right? Or like sing carols. So that I remember thinking back too, like it's it's weird hearing people sing like Silent Night or Noel while we're at the Ooh. beach. <laughs> like, okay. Like a hundred degree weather. <laughs> yeah, but I know at home it was snowy as hell, like everybody's miserable. <laughs> we're just out there having a ball. That's so. awesome. <laughs> um and then New Year's Eve, also like every country. 
uh, we we go hard. So in Valparaíso, which is like a big area known for like concerts and stuff like that, I think the Beatles actually perform there. Nice. But they're known for hosting the biggest New Year's festival in the country. So the the largest firework display in Latin America in general. The tradition, some hold on. Oh. There is a tradition during this time where some people put money in their shoe and walk around the block to attract luck, money, and future travel opportunities. Hmm. I have heard of that tradition because I remember being weird and walking around with money in my sock. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Interesting. Okay. Also practice writing down negative experiences and burning the paper as a symbolic act of letting go and moving towards the future. Ha, that's what we did. <laughs> right? <laughs> no wonder I'm spiritual. <laughs> now, indigenous people in Chile celebrate June 24th as New Year's uh, with winter solstice. Okay. And then the Mapuche festivals are held in Temuco and Santiago. And that's a celebration cycle of life and harvests. Okay. So they go hard too, but there's tons, tons more. But at that point, I'm going to take up the whole, the whole hour, if not two, but arguably one of the most important celebrations. And I do agree with this is the independence day, which we know as El, Dis El 18. <laughs> okay. And you know about that one because I'm always yes. going hard about that. I went. The empanadas were amazing. I <sighs> love the cheese ones. I'm very biased. Your mother's empanadas, <sighs> the cheese empanadas are the best ever. Oh, and then the I empanada de horno, like, uh, those are really good too. And I'll get into that here shortly. <laughs> But there's always high energy parades during this time, rodeo competitions, there's food, music, dancing. So have what you will with that. <laughs> uh, a lot of celebrities from Chile, though, are Pedro Pascal, who is the Mandalorian. Woo -woo. Yeah. Uh, Cote de Pablo. She's an NCIS. Oh, I love her. Oh, she's gorgeous. She's my favorite in she's that gorgeous. show. She's gorgeous. What was her name in that show? <sighs> Freak, what was her name? I said, I'm all saying she was my favorite. I don't really remember. Because <laughs> <laughs> I remember she was hooking up with Denozo. Freaking me, what is her name? <clears throat> I'm going to get all mad when I think about it. Anyway, I'll think of it. Okay. Well, she's from Chile. And she's also in the movie The 33. And if you haven't seen that, it's about the Chilean miners and when it, the good mine collapsed. Movie. Such a good movie. And Ziva. Ziva. Okay, that's right. Ziva Debbie. That's right. Uh... So, in the end, there's also Pablo Neruda and Gabriela Mistral, which are really, like, famous poets down in Chile. Then there's also Isabel Allende, and she is a writer. She wrote House of Spirits. And nice. in a much later episode, I'm going to do a whole bunch that has to do with her and her father. So, pending soon! But Ending soon. <laughs> now I'm going to lead into my main topic of the Chilean like roots for Cinco de Mayo, La Cueca. Mm -hmm. And that's our native dance. Like that's our national dance. That's your flacorico. Mm hmm. It is short for Zama Cueca. And it dates back even before I'm sure, to, um, but it dates back to 1824. It originated in Peru. The sound and music is a mix of, like, Andean rhymes and Spanish music, so it was repopulized more in the 20th century. Okay. Uh, there's also these types of dances in Argentina and Bolivia, too. And this dance was declared the National Dance of Chile on September 18th, 1979, by Pinochet. I will not say my opinions about that man. <laughs> Uh, the, it was also used for partner finding. There's a dance where they reenact the courting ritual of a rooster and a hen. And I know oh. that one really well. Yep. The male, he's supposed to be like really enthusiastic, sometimes an aggressive attitude while attempting to court the female. <laughs> and the female is elusive, defensive, and demure. <laughs> so. The, oh my God, I can picture it. <laughs> the dance finishes with. The man kneeling on one knee and the woman placing her foot triumphantly on his raised knee. 
I, oh, I love that I, pose. Yeah, I definitely recall that. Uh, Chilean cueca, though, is not zama cueca. It's a mix of different dances of the time. So zama cueca is just the main influence, similar to the to what you were saying about Mexico mm-hmm. and the dances. Now, cueca sola, this one, I, I, uh, it kind of pulls on the heartstrings a little bit. It's just a solo variant of La Cueca, but it was created in 1978 by Violeta Zuniga. And she was a member of the the Association of Families of the Detained and Disappeared. Again, in a future episode, I will definitely get more into that because that's a a whole different spiel. But it was a nonviolent protest, essentially, against the Pinochet dictatorship. So it inspired a 1987 song called They Dance Alone by Sting. Wow. Yeah, I actually have that song, I think, somewhere. But... It's not the one you showed me. Or you showed me a different one. Probably. I don't know if I've ever showed you that one. Uh, maybe you didn't. I don't know. I don't know. We'll look into it. You'll have to show me. But it's... it's Because normally with Wicca, it's performed with a man and a woman. And during that time a lot of the men disappeared. So the oh. girls were dancing solo as kind of like a nonviolent protest against what Pinochet was doing at that time. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, that one's hard. But That's amazing, though. See, oh, the yeah. power of, like, art and well, dance. And, like... My Thea, the one that you know, she actually did a similar protest, but mm-hmm. it, it was a different type of protest. But she she protested it as part of that. Mm-hmm. So that's where I'm like, oh, there's a lot of connection with my family and what happened during that time. But the clothing and dance in general, um, the traditional Chilean clothes for the men is a wassail hat, which is kind of like their rancho, rancheros, like yeah. their little cowboys. Um they have their shirt, their flannel poncho, some riding pants and boots, a short jacket, riding boots as well, and spurs. <laughs> they're they're equipped. And then the women just have some cute flower dresses. <laughs> now, the colors are typically blue, white, red, or black type of costumes and dresses. But according to Wikipedia, the man approaches the woman and offers his arm. Then the woman accompanies him and they walk around the room. They then face each other and hold their handkerchief in the air and begin to dance. They never touch, but still maintain contact through facial expressions and movements. During the dance, the pair must wave the white handkerchief. Okay. That's the main basis of the dance. There's definitely a lot more to it. But in the end, um, yeah, if you guys want to look into more of La Cueca, then definitely look that up on YouTube. There's a couple good dances. Fun. Good like music, but nothing compares to watching my cousins perform it. Cause like I said before, your sisters perform. I literally have cousins. One now who actually owns like the dance studio and stuff nice. like that. That's awesome. Yeah, Belen. She's one of my favorite cousins. But her, her mom, and her two younger sisters performed. Yep, Belen. It's just Bethlehem technically. That sounds so much prettier. Like, In Spanish, <laughs> Belen. So, but yeah, she. It's, I can't even come to words as to how well she performs. She's a fantastic dancer. I don't know if she's still she's a doing true it. Performer. Yeah, she was teaching it last I heard, but that's been a while ago. So yeah, it's like my sisters. Yep. Yeah. But now I'm gonna get into the part two of Chile stuff, and that's also the food. So that comes Ooh, to food. Oh, Comes to glorious one of our native food. glorious foods, <laughs> pastel de choclo. Oof. Essentially, it's a corn and beef casserole, but it's the best one you'll ever taste, in my opinion. <laughs> I'm just saying. This is our national dish. She's not being biased or anything. No. <laughs> so, uh, according to Pillar Hernandez, she has like an article online under like chileanfoodandgarden.com, but this one is a classic during summertime. Traditional pastel is usually cooked in a clay dish in like a wood-burning oven if you're living in the countryside. My mama, I remember, had an entire set from Chile. I remember. (laughs) I remember. (laughs) 
I think we were like at one of those shops like near the beach. I remember just looking over and seeing her pulling this giant ass clay casserole dish and all the little bowls that came with it and a couple other things. That's us. Awesome. I was like, Mom, really? And she was like, Necesitamos uno. She kept that thing for years. I think she still has them, actually. I would hope so. Oh, yeah. But it's made with the filling of pino, which is just ground beef and onions. That's what we like to call it. There's a piece of chicken, like a leg or a quarter of a boob, raisins, <laughs> olives, uh, half of a hard-boiled egg. It's topped with a sweet corn puree, and you also top it with some sugar. You and your Chilean food, man, there's always so something sweets in it. Of course! I like, like, it's so interesting. It's in our blood! It's, uh, yeah, sweets. I'm spicy. <laughs> we don't have a lot of spice. See, yeah. okay, quit giving us Chileans hell because just because the name is Chile does not mean we have Chiles. They're like, always cold. Think of Chile that way. <laughs> I guess. And not even then. It's hot as hell down there, too. Yeah, that's why you guys get so cold We're all the time. We're close to hell. <laughs> <laughs> you always complain that you're cold. <laughs> yeah. It's because I need to be down there where it's hot. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Either which way, though. Anyway. <laughs> I digress. Your but, sweet food is still delicious. Oh, so good. And then you just bake it in the oven for hours. But the puree is usually mixed with, like, basil and herbs for some flavor. And then it's served with, like, a usual side dish that I have grown up with, the ensalada chilena. It's so <laughs> simple. It's onions, tomato, and cilantro. Ooh. Ooh, didn't you make that for me? I did. It was so good. It's so simple. It's delicious. It's so delicious. You could obviously add a little more to it. God, but she cooks that's with amazing. love. I do. So with the Wikipedia page under Pastel de Choclo, it is similar to the Mexican dish, Pastel de, de Ilote. Mm -hmm. Also to corn pudding for the English. <laughs> I say that with love. Ah, I love Ilote. Now, you can also use the filling that's usually left over to fill Chilean empanadas. Mm -hmm. And we call them empanadas del horno. It's so good. I know there's so many, like, there's a couple other cultures that also have empanadas as well, but I'm sorry, dude. You're being biased. I, I love, yeah, I am. I am. But I love the Chilean ones. I think it's because my mama made them. You know, you can't help but gravitate <laughs> oh, to mama's on. food. You always know mama's cooking is always the best. No now, don't what. get me wrong, though. Like, I only see my mom, like, every so often. I need to be better about that. But when your dad cooks food that is similar to what she's cooked. Oh, my dad. I love when my dad cooks. Oh, it's so good. My it mom's just makes too. My it feel like cook. home. But yeah, but, it's that it's that feeling where you like, no, that's not better. Oh, man. Can't make it like that. Exactly. But, yeah. Overall, though, I couldn't find much history as far as where it came from. Besides the fact that it originated in colonial times. Most likely by the Mapuche, which is just indigenous people from South Chile. And the cooks in the kitchens of the Spanish settlers, they made it as a reminder of home for them. So it always was known as a comfort food. Aww. And that's exactly what it is. It is a comfort food. Every time I, like, as I was looking up, like, the photos and recipes of them, I not only got hungry, but I just felt comforted more and more. Wish I could find more about its, like, history, but I, you can only find so much with food, you know? Mm. We need to go eat some good food now. Yeah, really, though. And represent our Latino culture. Yes, so be safe on Cinco de Mayo. Yes, I have mean... some fun. And if you're new to Denver, come check out Cinco de Mayo. Yes, it's go. So it's, a, it's, it's at the Capitol, essentially. What uh -huh. is it, the Civic Center? Yep, Civic Center. Okay, so, uh, yeah. It's a big old thing. You can't miss it. Just look into it. <laughs> Literally, into you it. can't miss it. If you no. go downtown, you can't miss it. Not at all. <laughs> it's always hectic down there anyways, but it, it's obvious. And it's, all, it's all over the weekend, too, so yep. be safe. Have fun. Drink up. Drink responsibly. <laughs> drink some tequila. Yeah! <laughs> bye! All right, guys, bye!